waters off the coast of Norway, researchers recently detected a shipwreck while exploring the seabed. Is this the wreckage of the HMS Thistle? The British submarine was near the Norwegian coast in 1940 when it was sunk by a German U-boat. It was the first British sub destroyed by the Germans during World War II. Officials have confirmed that this is indeed a World War II era submarine and the Thistle was the only one of those to be in this area at that time. So this could be the first sighting of the watercraft in 83 years. The British Royal Navy wants the wreck to be left alone. If it is the Thistle, it's the final resting place of the submarine's 53 crew members. Great to see you found the world from A to Z with me on 1023.23. My name is Carl Azus, AKA Inspector Gadget. Not really my nickname, but I figured it was coming on Twitter. So whether you're online at worldatoz.org or now at youtube.com slash at the world from A to Z, I am thrilled to have you watching my new show. Quick update for you now. Three points on the war in the Middle East. One, international aid is getting into Gaza. Dozens of large trucks entered the Palestinian-controlled territory over the weekend, carrying needed food, water, and medical supplies. Hamas, the group that leads Gaza, launched a terrorist attack against Israel earlier this month. In response, Israel launched airstrikes and shut off gas, electricity, and supplies to Gaza in an effort to pressure Hamas to give up the roughly 200 hostages it took. Two, a pair of American Israeli hostages, a mother and daughter, have been freed from captivity in Gaza. It's not known exactly why Judith and Natalie Ronan were chosen to be the first people released by Hamas or if something was given in exchange. But the relatives of other hostages are hopeful that more releases are on the way. Three, U.S. President Joe Biden has asked Congress to approve an additional $100 billion to support Israel in its war against Hamas and to support Ukraine in its war against Russia. American leadership is what holds the world together. American alliances are what keep us, America, safe. American values are what make us a partner that other nations want to work with. To put all that at risk, if we walk away from Ukraine, if we turn our backs on Israel, it's just not worth it. But some U.S. lawmakers don't think the government should send additional support to Israel. Others have been hesitant to continue sending support to Ukraine, so it's unclear when or if that spending package will get approval. On this date in world history. In 2001, Apple released the first iPod. It retailed for $399 and it held about a thousand songs. It wasn't the first MP3 player, but it was small and easy to use. The company introduced dozens of iPod models before discontinuing the product last year. On this date in 2002, a group of terrorists from Chechnya stormed a theater in Moscow, Russia, taking hundreds of people hostage. The Chechens demanded that the Russian military leave Chechnya, a war-torn Russian republic between the Caspian and Black Seas. Three days later, Russian special forces ended the crisis by assaulting the rebels after filling the theater with a type of poison gas but experts say dozens of the hostages also died as a result. And in 2006, the former CEO of a company called Enron was sentenced for committing financial fraud. It was significant because the energy company's collapse was one of the largest bankruptcies in American history. Several Enron executives were convicted of deceiving the government and investors. Many workers lost their jobs and retirement savings and investors lost billions of dollars. A sweltering summer in many parts of the Northern Hemisphere. Drought in Brazil that's left houseboats high and dry on the Amazon. These are some of the weather phenomena that have been blamed, at least in part, on El Nino. Temperature changes in the Pacific Ocean can have far-reaching effects across the planet, and they're expected to mean some changes for the American winter ahead, which officially begins on December 21st. But you hear us use words like can and expected to. Weather forecasting is not considered to be an exact science, though there's a lot of interest in it, especially with El Nino knocking at America's western door. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, forecasts a winter with the potential for some powerful snowstorms in some parts of the country and maybe some drought relief where it is needed. Winter will be wetter and warmer in parts of the U.S. thanks to El Nino, a natural ocean and weather pattern in the tropical Pacific. 
That forecast according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. But John Gottschalk of NOAA's Climate Prediction Center says you should still unpack the winter coats. There will be certainly periods of below normal temperatures. There'll be uh, those Arctic outbreaks. What we're saying basically is more that there may be less, less of them and of shorter duration potentially this year. El Nino brings the potential for more precipitation, especially in the Northeast where it could deliver two or three major snowstorms. And above average precipitation as rain, snow or icy mix that's forecast from the plains to the Southwest could be welcomed after a summer of extreme drought. Overall, it could be very much a needed benefit relief for the drought conditions that are occurring in those areas. Looking back on hallmarks of recent El Nino winters, the 2018-19 season saw the wettest winter on record for the U.S. mainland, according to NOAA, and a very strong El Nino during the 2015-16 winter contributed to the warmest winter on record for the U.S. mainland. The El Nino of 2009 and 2010 was actually forecast roughly with similar strength to the one this winter. The southern and central U.S. actually felt a good bit of cold during that season, and the northeast got socked with blizzards in rapid succession. Here in D.C., we called that Snowmageddon. In Washington, I'm Karen Kafa. Oh, it out. Cox's Bazaar Beach, which is nearly 75 miles long, is a tourist attraction in what country? South Africa, Bangladesh, India, Vietnam. One of the longest beaches in the world, Cox's Bazaar, can be found on the Bay of Bengal in Bangladesh. In Bangladesh, the monsoon season usually brings five months of flooding to some areas, but recently, part of the country has seen fields underwater for eight to ten months. It has farmers leaning on an old tradition. Floating farms are an ancient idea, and a few centuries ago, Bangladesh farmers first began constructing floating garden platforms. Now, they're again a lifeline. People are actually putting an invasive problem plant to good use. The stems of water hyacinths are woven together to create rafts. The rafts provide a bed for growing cucumber, radish, pumpkin, papaya, and tomato seedlings. Some 6,000 Bangladeshi subsistence farmers use floating garden beds like these. 300 acres of rafts float across the country, 100 acres up from five years ago. It takes 15 to 20 days for the plants to grow before we can collect them. We use water hyacinths to make floating beds. This way we can harvest five times a year. In this region, frequent storms and monsoons are aggravated by shifts in the Earth's tectonic plates that cause the ground to sink, making the land susceptible to flooding. Plants need nourishment found in dirt. But a good supply of nutrients like carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen can also be in water and can fuel plant growth. Hydroponics is catching on around the world. And in Bangladesh, it's successful enough to attract government funding. Local authorities have offered support for raft farmers in an effort to sustain the drowning agricultural industry. Whether you say Missouri or Missouri, we're showing you the show me state first today in our world of viewers. Mr. Cartwright's class is watching from Kansas City at Northland Christian School. From there, we're headed to Brighton, Tennessee, the volunteer state, where we've got Miss Angie's class online today. Hello to everyone at Brighton Middle School. In the Northern Hemisphere, it's probably a question most of us have never thought about. What would you do if a kangaroo threatened your dog? That's what happened to an Australian martial arts instructor recently. Look at my dog. His yelling didn't get the marsupial to stop, so the man slapped the kangaroo, which knocked his phone into the river, but it did let the dog go. The video went viral partly because of how ripped the kangaroo is. Thankfully, everything involved in the encounter is fine. That was not the recommended course of action. Kangaroos are protected in Australia, and you don't want a wallop bee in a kickboxing contest with an animal that's hopping mad and doesn't play by the kangaroo rules. Even if it's not hiding something in its pouch, you could Queensland in jail staring at the wallaroos if you lose your marsup appeal. So there's no shame in turning tail in a hop skip and jump out of there if Joey Frazier, Joey Lewis, Joey Maxim, or Jersey Joey Walcott puts up his dukes. I'm Carl Azus, knocking out another edition of The World from A to Z, and we hope for a rematch tomorrow.